The Little Wave A little wave was bobbing along in the ocean and was having a grand old time. He was enjoying the wind and the fresh air as it traveled, until he noticed that all the other waves in front of him were crashing against the shore. Oh my God, this terrible, the little wave thought. Look what is happening to all the other waves, and I will have to face the same fate. When the little wave was in a state of panic, another wave came across and asked the little wave, Why are you distressed, my friend? The little wave said, We are all going to crash against the shore and face our end. All of us waves are going to be nothing. Isn't it terrible? The second wave answered with a smile, No, you don't understand. You're not just a wave. You are a part of the ocean. 2. Everyone has a story. A young man in his twenties was seeing out from the train's window shouted, Father, look at the trees. They are going behind. The young man's father smiled at the man, and a young couple sitting nearby looked at the young man's childish comment with pity. Suddenly, the young man exclaimed again, Father, look at the clouds. They are all running with us. The couple couldn't resist and said to the old man, Why don't you take your son to a good doctor? The older man smiled and said, We did, and we are just coming from the hospital. My son was blind from birth, and he just got his vision today. Every person in the world has a story. Don't judge people before you truly know them. The truth might surprise you. 3. Waiting for Rabbit Suicide once there lived a lazy farmer who did not enjoy working hard in the fields. He spent his days napping under a tree. One day, while he was resting under a tree, a fox came chasing a rabbit. There was a loud thump. The rabbit had crashed into the tree and died. The farmer picked up the dead rabbit and took it home, frustrating the hell out of the fox. The farmer cooked and ate the rabbit for dinner and sold its fur at the market. The farmer thought to himself, if I could get a rabbit like that every day, I'd never have to work again. The next day, the farmer went right back to the tree and waited for another rabbit to die similarly. He saw a few rabbits, but none of them ran into the tree like before. Indeed, it was a very rare incident, but the farmer did not realize it. Oh, well, he thought cheerfully, there's always tomorrow. Since he was just waiting for the rabbit to hit a tree and die, he did not give any attention to his field. Weeds grew in his rice field. Soon the farmer had to be hungry as he ran out of his rice and never caught any other rabbit too. Do not wait for good things to come without doing anything. Do not give your life to luck without working for success. Four. An Older Man and Joke Some people complain about life. This story gives us the chance to ask ourselves if we're wasting time complaining. People were continually visiting an older man, complaining about the same old problems in life. Over and over again, the older man would hear the same complaints. One day, instead of offering advice, the older man decided to tell them a joke. People roared with laughter. A few minutes later, he told them the exact same joke, and a few of them smiled. He then said the joke a third time, and nobody laughed or smiled. The wise older man then asked them, If you can't laugh at the same joke over and over, why are you always crying over the same problem? The takeaway of the story, don't complain. Find solutions and learn how to gain control over any situation. Instead of complaining and dwelling on various issues, make strides to change the situation. 5. Is the jar of your time full? Once, I attended a seminar where the instructor was lecturing on time. At one point he said, OK, time for a quiz. He reached under the table and pulled out a wide-mouthed gallon jar. He set it on the table next to a platter with some fist-sized rocks on it. How many of these rocks do you think we can get in the jar? He asked. After we made our guess, he said, OK, let's find out. He set one rock in the jar, then another, then another. 
I don't remember how many he got in, but he got the jar full. Then he asked, Is this jar full? Everyone looked at the rocks and said, Yes. The trainer said, Ah. He reached under the table and pulled out a bucket of gravel. Then he dumped some gravel in and shook the jar, and the gravel went in all the little spaces left by the big rocks. Thereafter, he grinned and said once more, Is the jar full? By this time, the participants guessed the answer from past experience. Probably not, we said. Good, he replied. Then he reached under the table and brought out a bucket of sand and started dumping the sand in the jar. It went into all of the little spaces left by the rocks and the gravel. Once more, he looked and said, Is this jar full? No, we roared. He said, Good. And he grabbed a pitcher of water and began to pour it in. He got something like a quart of water in that jar. Then he said, Well, what's the point? Somebody said, Well, there are gaps. And if you work really hard, you can always fit some more things into your life. No, he said, that's not really the point. The point is this. Put the big rocks in first. The trainer continued. Now, I want you to recognize that this jar is your life. The fist-sized rocks are the important things. Your physical and mental health, your family, your life partner and children. Anything that is so important to you that if it were lost... It will make a big impact on your life and you would be nearly destroyed. The gravels are the other things in life that matter, but lesser than the above ones. The gravels represent things like your career, job, house, friends, social connections, or car. The sand is everything else, the other small stuff in life. If you put the sand or the pebbles into the jar first, there is no room for the rocks. That's why I said, the point is, put the big rocks in first. He continued, I hope now you understand the same goes for your life. If you spend all your energy and time on the lesser important small stuff and materialistic things, you will never have space for the things that are truly most important. Pay attention to the things that are important in your life and spend time on the important it was great food for thought for all the participants. It changed my approach towards managing time in life. Moral of the short story on time management. The story communicates few strong lessons. First, we all need to manage our jar of time and put the big rocks, important and top priority tasks, first. Prioritizing will help us to decide which task is to be done first and which one at later stage. Second, we need to make achieve balance in life. We have a lot of time wasters in life. During that time, we can put gravels, moderate priority and value, sand, less priority, and water, no priority but important, as per the priority and space available. Making a balance of all these will bring more satisfaction in life. You just can't keep focus excessively on one thing and then completely neglect the other ones. Time is gold. It's precious. Spend it wisely and stop wasting time on unimportant things. Focus on the rocks. Stop wasting time. 6. Meaningless Goals A farmer had a dog who used to wait by the roadside for vehicles to come. As soon as one came, he would run down the road, barking and trying to overtake the car. One day, the farmer's neighbor asked the farmer, do you think the dog is ever going to overtake those vehicles? The farmer replied, That is not what bothers me. What bothers me is what he would do if he ever caught one. Many people in life behave like that dog who is pursuing meaningless goals. 7. The Fisherman and the Businessman Once upon a time, there was a businessman who was sitting on the beach in a small Italian village. As he sat taking a brief break from the stress of his daily schedule, he saw a fisherman rowing a small boat back into the harbor. In the boat were a few large fish. Impressed, the businessman asked the fisherman, How long does it take you to catch so many fish? To which he replied, Oh, not so long. The businessman was confused. Why don't you fish for longer to catch even more? More? 
This is enough to feed my entire family and even offer some to my neighbors, the fisherman said. So what do you do for the rest of your day? inquired the businessman. The fisherman replied, Well, I have usually have caught my fish by late morning, at which point I go home, kiss my wife, and play with my kids. In the afternoon, I take a nap and read. In the evening, I go to the village to have a drink with my friends, play guitar, sing, and dance into the night. Putting his entrepreneurial hat on, the businessman offered a suggestion. I have a Ph.D. in business. I can help you become much more successful. From now on, you should spend longer at sea and catch as many fish as possible. When you've saved enough money, buy a bigger boat to catch even more fish. From there, you'll soon be able to buy more boats, set up your own company, build a production plant to can the fish and control distribution, and move to the city to control your other branches. To this, the fisherman asks, and after that? The businessman laughs. After that, you'll be able to live like a king, take your company public, float your shares, and be rich. And after that? asks the fisherman once more. After that, you can retire, move to a house by the sea, wake up early in the morning to go fishing, then return home to play with your kids, kiss your wife, take a nap in the afternoon, and join your friends in the village to drink, play guitar and dance into the night. Puzzled, the fisherman replies, but isn't that what I'm doing already? Be content with what you have. Do you really need to keep pushing for more? Stress is often a choice. There's joy and peace in simplicity. 8. The Shepherd's Boy and the Wolf The Shepherd's Boy and the Wolf is a classic story with a moral about lying. It's the original moral story of the common phrase, to cry wolf. A shepherd boy who watched a flock of sheep near a village brought out the villagers three or four times by crying out, Wolf! Wolf! And when his neighbors came to help him, laughed at them for their pains. The wolf, however, did truly come at last. The shepherd boy, now really alarmed, shouted in an agony of terror, Pray, do come and help me. The wolf is killing the sheep, but no one paid any heed to his cries, nor rendered any assistance. The wolf, having no cause of fear, at his leisure lacerated or destroyed the whole flock. There is no believing a liar, even when he speaks the truth. Always tell the truth, or at least don't lie. 9. The Black Balloon There was a man who made his living selling balloons at a beach. He was center of attraction for the small kids, who were coming to beach along with their families to spend the quality time. The balloon seller used to sell balloons of many different colors, including red, yellow, blue, orange, pink, violet, and green. He knew how well the different colors attract the children. Whenever the business used to get slow, he had a wonderful strategy to boost his sales. What the balloon seller used to do is to release a helium-filled balloon into the air. When the children saw the colorful balloon go up, they all wanted one. They would come up to him with parents, buy a balloon, and his sales would go up. All day, he continued to release a balloon whenever sales were slow. One day, when his balloon sales were low, he adopted the same strategy. He released a helium-filled blue-colored balloon into the air. As expected, the balloon man felt someone tugging at his jacket. He turned around and found a little boy smiling towards him. The balloon seller asked him, Which color balloon do you want? The innocent little boy looked towards helium-filled balloon into the air and asked with a curiosity, If you release a black balloon, will that also fly? Moved by the cute little boy's concern, the balloon man replied gently, My dear son, it is not the color of the balloon. It is what's inside that makes it go up. If you try to analyze and correlate this short story, the same principle applies to our lives. It's what's inside that counts. Your inner beliefs, core values and principles, personality, character and attitude which defines how successful you will be in life. Do you know 
Among these, what's the core inner or inside characteristic of us which accelerates our velocity to go up? That is our attitude. Yes, our attitude is most important. It applies to every sphere of life, including professional as well as personal life. The great part of attitude is that we can design our lives by changing our attitudes of mind. It's inner beauty that counts, not the outer one. The caste, skin color, or religion does not matter in success. People may show off and manipulate their outer presence and behavior, but if they are not positive from inside, they will not go up high in life. Always remember, you are made to fly high. If you have positive attitude and optimistic approach towards life, you will definitely achieve you goals and get success in life. 10. The Two Wolves An old Cherokee chief sat down to teach his grandson about life. There's a fight going on inside me, he tells the young boy. A fight between two wolves. One wolf is evil. It's full of malice, anger, greed self-pity, and false pride. The other is good. It's full of peace, love, joy, kindness, and humility. This same fight is going on inside you and everyone else on the face of the earth. The grandson was quiet, pondering this revelation for a moment before asking, Grandfather, which wolf will win? The old man smiled and replied, The one you feed. Good and evil exist within each of us. It's our responsibility to own that reality and do whatever we can to nurture the good. 11. The Story of the Grateful Starfishes One morning, an elderly man was walking along the beach when he noticed a young boy picking something off the sand and throwing it into the sea. As he got closer, the man realized the child was throwing stranded starfishes that had washed up on the shore back into the breaking waves. Approaching the boy, the man asked what he was doing. The starfish will die if they're still on the shore when the sun rises, he replied. Perplexed, the old man said, but that's pointless. There are countless miles of beach and thousands of starfish. It doesn't matter how many you return to the water, you can't make a difference. Unfazed, the boy bent down, picked up another starfish, and tossed it into the sea. It matters to this one, he said. No matter the odds of success or the scale of the challenge, your actions can make a difference. It's better to light a candle than curse the dark. Every little counts. Doing something to make a positive change is always better than nothing. 12. The Elephant and the Rope one day, a man walked past a camp of elephants. Looking closer, he was surprised to see that these mighty animals weren't held in cages or kept in chains. The only thing stopping them from escaping, a thin rope tied from one of their legs to a simple pole in the ground. Confused as to why they didn't use their strength to break the rope, he asked the trainer why they weren't attempting to run away. To this, the trainer replied, As baby elephants, we use the same system, but at that age, the rope is strong enough to stop them from escaping. They grow up like this, believing they can never break the rope, so even as adults, they stay put. In other words, these powerful, magnificent, and intelligent elephants didn't believe they could free themselves, so they never tried. Our personal beliefs are powerful beyond measure and often dictate our outcomes, they can work for or against us. Identify your limiting beliefs so you can push against them. 13. The Baker and the Butter A long time ago, a baker and a farmer lived in the same small English village. These two men had a friendly arrangement in place, where the farmer would sell a pound of butter to the baker each day. One morning, the baker decided to weigh the butter to see if he'd received the correct amount. To his surprise, he discovered that the farmer had sold him less butter than he'd paid for. Angry about the unfairness, he took the farmer to court. At the hearing, the judge asked the farmer whether he used any measure to weigh the butter. Your Honor, 
I am but a lowly farmer and do not own a proper measure. I simply use an old-fashioned scale, he replied. How do you weight the butter, then, inquired the judge. To this the farmer answered, Your Honor, long before the baker started buying butter from my farm, I've been buying a pound loaf of bread from him. Every day when he brings me the bread, I place it on my scale and give him the same weight in butter. If anyone is to be blamed, it's the baker. Karma's a bitch. Be kind and fair to others and you'll enjoy the rewards. 14. The Pursuit of Happiness There was once a group of 100 people attending a seminar on personal development. In the middle of their talk, the speaker stops and decides to run an impromptu group activity. He hands out a balloon to each attendee and tells them to write their name on it. The balloons are then collected and placed in an adjacent room. The speaker then instructs the 100 attendees to enter that room and within five short minutes, find the balloon with their name on it. Pandemonium breaks loose as they charge in, pushing and colliding with each other as they desperately search for their name. The five minutes pass and nobody succeeds. The speaker then tells each person to pick up any random balloon and give it the person whose name is written on it. Within a few minutes, everyone has their balloon back. He then said, what just happened with those balloons is exactly what happens in our search for happiness. We frantically look for it all around us, not knowing where it is. Yet our happiness lies in the happiness of others. By giving them their happiness, you get yours. Happiness and fulfillment rarely come from selfish pursuits, but almost always come from doing good deeds for others. By helping others, we help ourselves. 15. Buridan's Ass A hungry ass finds himself between two equally large and delicious-looking bales of hay. He looks from one to the other and back again, unsure which to choose. This goes on for a long while until, unable to make a decision, the poor old donkey dies of starvation. Moral of the story. Once again, take action. Don't linger too long on the precipice of a big or small decision when the outcomes are positive. Save yourself a headache, take a leap of faith, commit, and enjoy whatever rewards that come your way, refusing to look back at what could have been. 16. The Dragon and the Treasure In many ancient myths and stories, the hero has to go on a long and perilous journey to complete their mission. A classic example, the sleepless dragon that guards its treasure, breathing fire on anyone who so dares to steal it. To get the gold, the knight in shining armor must, through guile or force, first defeat this beast. Success lies on the other side of effort, which makes suffering part of the process. Rather than avoid discomfort then, the ambitious must pursue it at all costs, only by butting heads and pushing through such suffering will they ever attain the proverbial gold. 17. The Pear Tree and the Seasons of Life There was once a man who had four young sons. Wanting to teach them about the dangers of judging things too rapidly, he decided to send each of them on a journey, one after the other, to a distant pear tree. Each son went in a different season, the first in winter, the second in spring, and so on. At the end of the year, he brought his children together and asked them what they'd seen. The son who traveled in winter described a gnarled, twisted, and barren tree that stood stark and ugly against the land. The son who went in spring disagreed. No, he said. The tree seemed full of hope and promise with green buds along its branches. The third son, who'd traveled in summer, disagreed once more. The pear tree he'd seen was covered in beautiful blossoms that looked and smelled divine. Finally, the last son, who'd made the journey in fall, disagreed again, describing a tree laden with sweet and delicious pears that tasted better than any he'd eaten before. When each son had spoken, the father said they were all correct, because they'd only seen but one season of the pear tree's life. 
He explained to his sons that it's foolish and impossible to judge something in this manner. The essence of something, whether it's a tree or their fellow man, can only be measured as a whole at the end of the year, having seen it in its fullness. To make your judgment in winter is to miss the promise of spring, the beauty of summer, and the fruit in fall. Refuse to judge yourself, life, or other people based upon a single mistake or challenging time. Refuse to let the pain of one season destroy the joy of those to come. 18. The Story of the Lumberjacks Two lumberjacks of equal skill, experience, and stature work side by side, chopping down trees together every single day. However, one lumberjack works non-stop, without taking a break, whereas the other takes an hour-long lunch break every afternoon. Despite working for less time, both lumberjacks inevitably chop the same number of trees by the end of each working day. Puzzled and frustrated, the lumberjack who works all day long asks the other how he manages to chop just as much as him while still taking a break. To this, he responds, It's simple. I spend that hour at home sharpening my axe. Breaks are vital to productivity. Work smart, not hard. 19. Potatoes, Eggs, and Coffee Beans Once upon a time, a daughter complained to her father that her life was miserable and that she didn't know how she was going to make it. She was tired of fighting and struggling all the time. It seemed just as one problem was solved, another one soon followed. Her father, a chef, took her to the kitchen. He filled three pots with water and placed each on a high fire. Once the three pots began to boil, he placed potatoes in one pot, eggs in the second pot, and ground coffee beans in the third pot. He then let them sit and boil without saying a word to his daughter. The daughter moaned and impatiently waited, wondering what he was doing. After 20 minutes, he turned off the burners. He took the potatoes out of the pot and placed them in a bowl. He pulled the eggs out and placed them in a bowl. He then ladled the coffee out and placed it in a cup. Turning to her, he asked, Daughter, what do you see? Potatoes, eggs, and coffee, she hastily replied. Look closer, he said, and touch the potatoes. She did and noted that they were soft. He then asked her to take an egg and break it. After pulling off the shell, she observed the hard-boiled egg. Finally, he asked her to sip the coffee. Its rich aroma brought a smile to her face. Father, what does this mean? she asked. He then explained that the potatoes, the eggs, and coffee beans had each faced the same adversity, the boiling water. However, each one reacted differently. The potato went in strong, hard, and unrelenting, but in boiling water it became soft and weak. The egg was fragile, with the thin outer shell protecting its liquid interior until it was put in the boiling water. Then the inside of the egg became hard. However, the ground coffee beans were unique. After they were exposed to the boiling water, they changed the water and created something new. Which are you? he asked his daughter. When adversity knocks on your door, how do you respond? Are you a potato, an egg, or a coffee bean? Ma, moral. In life, things happen around us. Things happen to us. But the only thing that truly matters is what happens within us. Which one are you? 20. Colonel Sanders, Vertical Bar, Kentucky Fried Chicken Once there was an older man who was broke, living in a tiny house and owned a beat-up car. He was living off of $1.99 Social Security checks. At 65 years of age, he decided things had to change. So he thought about what he had to offer. His friends raved about his chicken recipe. He decided that this was his best shot at making a change. He left Kentucky and traveled to different states to try to sell his recipe. He told restaurant owners that he had a mouth-watering chicken recipe. He offered the recipe to them for free, just asking for a small percentage on the item sold. Sounds like a good deal, right? Unfortunately, 
not to most of the restaurants. He heard no over 1,000 times. Even after all of those rejections, he didn't give up. He believed his chicken recipe was something special. He got rejected 1,009 times before he heard his first yes. With that one success, Colonel Hartland Sanders changed the way Americans eat chicken. Kentucky Fried Chicken, popularly known as KFC, was born. Remember, never give up and always believe in yourself in spite of rejection. 21. The Obstacle in Our Path There once was a very wealthy and curious king. This king had a huge boulder placed in the middle of a road. Then he hid nearby to see if anyone would try to remove the gigantic rock from the road. The first people to pass by were some of the king's wealthiest merchants and courtiers. Rather than moving it, they simply walked around it. A few loudly blamed the king for not maintaining the roads. Not one of them tried to move the boulder. Finally, a peasant came along. His arms were full of vegetables. When he got near the boulder, rather than simply walking around it as the others had, the peasant put down his load and tried to move the stone to the side of the road. It took a lot of effort, but he finally succeeded. The peasant gathered up his load and was ready to go on his way when he saw a purse lying in the road where the boulder had been. The peasant opened the purse. The purse was stuffed full of gold coins and a note from the king. The king's note said the purse's gold was a reward for moving the boulder from the road. The king showed the peasant what many of us never understand. Every obstacle presents an opportunity to improve our condition. Sign 22. Unstoppable. Extreme Makeover features a celebrity trainer helping very overweight individuals reach their weight loss goals. Sometimes their attitudes aren't great, but other times, the people on the show are truly amazing, like Sarah. Sarah is a little person standing at only four or five. She was a nutrition speaker on local television shows at the start of her journey, but ashamed of herself. Not only had she spent her life dealing with her short stature, but she had suffered greatly at the hands of her sister. She turned to eating, and by the time she was 37 years old, weighed over 200 pounds. When she began her time on Extreme Makeover, her first challenge was to climb the stairs of an amphitheater holding an 80-pound weight. The stairs came up past her knees, but she didn't complain once. She kept going. Slowly, all the people in the theater started to watch her. By the time she reached the last step, the crowd cheered for her. Her trainer gave her the goal to run a half marathon six months after starting her diet and exercise program. Sarah said no, she wouldn't run the half. Instead, she would run a full marathon. Her trainer advised against it because it would be extra hard on her body. She'd have to take many extra strides due to her short stature. Sarah didn't care. She ran the whole marathon. She succeeded in losing more than half her body weight and becoming a runner like she had always dreamed. 23. Winning the Battle Adrienne Brown shared her weight loss journey with good housekeeping. Adrienne loved to eat and was a bit food obsessed. As an adult, she owned two refrigerators stocked with food. She was already overweight at 180 pounds when her weight shot up as she battled breast cancer. Adrienne got serious about her health during her battle with cancer. Inspired by Jennifer Garner in Alias and determined to be healthier, Adrienne lost 90 pounds in a year by eliminating processed foods and exercising. She made it manageable by breaking her goal into 10-pound increments and keeping a positive attitude. 24. On God's Time a man walked to the top of a hill to talk to God. The man asked, God, what's a million years to you? And God said, a minute. Then the man asked, well, what's a million dollars to you? And God said, a penny. Then the man asked, God, can I have a penny? And God said, sure, in a minute. 25. The Weight of the Glass 
Once upon a time, a psychology professor walked around on a stage while teaching stress management principles to an auditorium filled with students. As she raised a glass of water, everyone expected they'd be asked the typical glass half empty or glass half full question. Instead, with a smile on her face, the professor asked, how heavy is this glass of water I'm holding? Students shouted out answers ranging from eight ounces to a couple pounds. She replied, from my perspective, the absolute weight of this glass doesn't matter. It all depends on how long I hold it. If I hold it for a minute or two, it's fairly light. If I hold it for an hour straight, its weight might make my arm ache a little. If I hold it for a day straight, my arm will likely cramp up and feel completely numb and paralyzed, forcing me to drop the glass to the floor. In each case, the weight of the glass doesn't change, but the longer I hold it, the heavier it feels to me. As the class shook their heads in agreement, she continued, Your stresses and worries in life are very much like this glass of water. Think about them for a while and nothing happens. Think about them a bit longer and you begin to ache a little. Think about them all day long and you will feel completely numb and paralyzed, incapable of doing anything else until you drop them. The Moral It's important to remember to let go of your stresses and worries. No matter what happens during the day, as early in the evening as you can, put all your burdens down. Don't carry them through the night and into the next day with you. If you still feel the weight of yesterday's stress, it's a strong sign that it's time to put the glass down. 26. The Story of the Chinese Farmer and the Horse Once upon a time, there was a Chinese farmer whose horse ran away. That evening, all of his neighbors came around to commiserate. They said, We are so sorry to hear your horse has run away. This is most unfortunate. The farmer said, maybe. The next day the horse came back bringing seven wild horses with it and in the evening everybody came back and said, oh, isn't that lucky? What a great turn of events. You now have eight horses. The farmer again said, maybe. The following day his son tried to break one of the horses and while riding it he was thrown and broke his leg. The neighbors then said, oh dear, that's too bad. And the farmer responded, maybe. The next day, the conscription officers came around to conscript people into the army, and they rejected his son because he had a broken leg. Again, all the neighbors came around and said, isn't that great? Again, he said, maybe. I've talked before in the blog about how all events, circumstances, and even life itself is neutral and has no inbuilt meaning. Events and circumstances in our life don't come prepackaged with any labels such as good or bad. Instead, we are the ones who attach a negative or positive meaning by the perspective with which we view them. However, when we attach a negative label or meaning to a certain event, our own perceptions cause us pain and makes us suffer. As the farmer's story illustrates, it is wise to refrain from attaching any negative meaning to the events that occur in our lives. The Story of the King and the Ring Once upon a time there was a king who said this to the members of his kingdom, I have bought one of the most beautiful diamonds in the world and I want to hide a message in the ring which I intend to pass on to my successors after my rule. The message should serve me and others in the times of desperation and struggle. It must be a short sentence that can be stashed under the ring's diamond. All those who listened were very clever and quick thinkers. They all could write passages and essays, but not a short sentence that is not longer than two, three words that would assist someone in the times of despair. They all thought but could not come up with what was needed. The king was a bit disappointed and he went into his chambers where his old servant met him. As the king's mother passed away at a very young age, he was raised majorly by this faithful servant. The king had tremendous respect for the servant and so he presented his current problem to him. The old man said, 
I'm not wise nor scholarly nor well-educated like the others, sir, but I do know of a message. During my life, in the palace, I've met all sorts of people, and once I met a wizard who was invited by your father. To thank me, he gave me this message. The old servant wrote something on a piece of paper and handed it to the king. But don't read it, he said. Keep it hidden in the ring and open it only when you have no other choice. Soon after, the kingdom was invaded and the king started to lose battles. He fled on his horse followed by his enemies. He was alone and his enemies were many. With no other choice, a cliff lay ahead of him and there was no way of return. He remembered the message inside the ring. He opened it, took out the piece of paper, and read the short message. This, too, shall pass. As soon as he read the message, he felt a great sense of silence and empowerment enveloping him. His enemies got lost in the woods and their horses were nowhere to be heard. The king was thankful to his old servant and the wizard. These words were incredible. He put the piece of paper back under the diamond in the ring and embarked on his journey back to his kingdom. The day he got back to his kingdom, all were feeling victorious. He was greeted with a big feast, and his happiness was spellbound. The old servant stood next to him and said, This moment, too, is right for another look at the hidden message, Raja. The king was amused, and he replied, now that I'm victorious, people are celebrating. I'm not desperate or in a no-option situation. Why would I even look at the message? The servant said, Listen to me, sir. This message is relevant both in times of despair and in good times as well. The king opened the message again. This too shall pass. The king again felt the great internal silence that he had felt before. Though he was celebrating, his pride and ego disappeared and diminished. The king understood the true meaning of the message, and he was enlightened. Just as everything in our external environment is constantly changing, the same is the case with everything in our internal environment. All our thoughts and feelings are like clouds in the sky, constantly arising and passing. The Buddhists call this phenomenon enika which means that everything is temporary or impermanent. Keeping this wisdom in our mind can heal and bring us comfort in challenging times as well as cherish and savor the beautiful yet transitory gift that is life. 27. The Fox and the Grapes The Fox and the Grapes is a popular fable about grit by Aesop, an ancient Greek storyteller. A famished fox saw some clusters of ripe black grapes hanging from a trellised vine. She resorted to all her tricks to get at them, but wearied herself in vain, for she could not reach them. At last she turned away, hiding her disappointment and saying, The grapes are sour and not ripe as I thought. If you think something is not worth having, ask yourself, Is that only because I think I'm unable to achieve it? 28. Two Little Mice Two Little Mice is a story with a moral about perseverance. In the 2002 movie Catch Me If You Can, Frank Abagnale, senior Christopher Walken, receives the highest honor at his local Rotary Club. He tells the story at the beginning of his speech. Two little mice fell into a bucket of cream. The first mouse quickly gave up and drowned. The second mouse wouldn't quit. He struggled so hard that eventually he churned that cream into butter and crawled out. The moral of the story, it's not over until it's over. However, Mr. Abagnale must have read the Chinese farmer story. In an act of foreshadowing, he ends the story by saying, Gentlemen, as of this moment, I am that second mouse. He was right. His good luck didn't last much longer in the movie. 29. The Hanoi Rat Bounty The Hanoi Rat Bounty is a story with a moral about entrepreneurial spirit and perverse incentives. At the end of the 19th century, during French colonial rule, Hanoi was plagued by rats. Driven by the desire to modernize the city, the governor-general instituted a bounty program. 
citizens were paid a small amount of money for each rat they killed. However, given the health risks, the colonial government didn't want piles of rat corpses to be handed over to officials. So instead, they paid locals for every rat tail they brought in. The tails soon became an object of value. The rat hunters soon realized that they didn't have to kill the rodents. A released rat with a cut-off tail could breed again and produce more valuable tails. Needless to say, the bounty failed to achieve the desired results. The rat plague was now worse than before. Beware of cobra effects and the unintended negative consequences of your intervention. 30. The Blind Men and an Elephant the Blind Men and an Elephant is an ancient Indian parable about objectivity. A group of blind men heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought to the town, but none of them were aware of its shape and form. Out of curiosity, they said, We must inspect and know it by touch, of which we are capable. So they sought it out, and when they found it, they groped about it. The first person, whose hand landed on the trunk, said, This being is like a thick snake. For another one, whose hand reached its ear, it seemed like a kind of fan. As for another person, whose hand was upon its leg, said, The elephant is a pillar, like a tree trunk. The blind man, who placed his hand upon its side, said the elephant, Is a wall. Another who felt its tail described it as a rope. The last felt its tusk, stating the elephant is that which is hard, smooth, and like a spear. Each of our perspectives can be true, yet incomplete. More things can be true at once. 31. The Necklace by Guy de Maupassant She was one of those pretty and charming women whose infatuation with luxury is their one form of heroism. Summary. The Necklace is a short story by Guy de Maupassant, first published in 1884. It follows the life of a woman named Mathilde Loisel, who is unhappy with her modest lifestyle and longs for wealth and luxury. One day, her husband secures an invitation to a fancy ball, and Mathilde borrows a diamond necklace from a wealthy friend to wear to the event. However, after the ball, she discovers that she has lost the necklace and spends years working to pay off the debt incurred by replacing it, only to learn that the original necklace was fake. Theme The theme of the necklace is the danger of materialism and the pursuit of social status. Matilda's obsession with wealth and status blinds her to the comfort she has in her current life, and leads her to make poor decisions that ultimately ruin her chances of happiness. Moral of the story. The story is a cautionary tale that teaches readers that material possessions and social status are not the keys to happiness. Matilda's relentless pursuit of luxury leads her to a life of poverty and misery, and her true happiness is found only when she accepts her circumstances and learns to appreciate the blessings in her life. 32. The Story of Colonel Sanders I made a resolve then that I was going to amount to something if I could, and no hours, nor amount of labor, nor amount of money would deter me from giving the best that there was in me. And I have done that ever since, and I win by it. I know. Summary the True Life account of Harlan Sanders, the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, is an inspiring and motivational story of success despite many rejections. Sanders was born in Indiana in 1890 and worked a variety of odd jobs to support his siblings after his father's death. At 40 years old, he began cooking and selling fried chicken out of a gas station in Corbin, Kentucky in the 1930s. He developed his own blend of 11 herbs and spices, and after that, his business grew steadily over the next few decades, leading to the creation of the KFC franchise. Theme The story of Colonel Sanders portrays perseverance and determination, even in the face of numerous setbacks and obstacles. 
Sanders refused to give up on his dream of creating a successful fried chicken business, and he continued to work tirelessly to achieve his goals. Moral of the story, Sanders' achievements teach us that success often comes from hard work, perseverance, and a refusal to give up in the face of adversity. Even when things seem bleak or impossible, it's important to keep pushing forward and striving to achieve your goals. With dedication and determination, anyone can achieve their dreams, just as Colonel Sanders did with his fried chicken empire. 33. Nail on the Fence Once there was a small town. A man was living happily with small family comprising his wife and a son. They had a beautiful house having lush green garden in front and backyard. As his son was growing up, he noticed that the little boy's behavior was getting changed. His son was developing a very bad temper. He tried to counsel him, but there was no result. The boy used to get angry very frequently, and often out of anger he used bad language. His words started hurting others. He scolded kids in school, neighbors, and even his friends due to anger. His friends and neighbors started avoiding him, and his parents were getting really worried about him. One beautiful morning, he called his son in his bedroom. The father had a plan to improve the behavior of his son. He gave him a bag of nails and a hammer and said that every time the boy lost his temper, he had to hammer a nail into the wooden fence of the backyard. At first, it sounded strange to the young boy, but the boy followed his father's instructions and on the very first day, he hammered 43 nails into wooden fence at the backyard. The father asked his son to notice how frequently Boy was getting annoyed and angry in a particular day. This was alarming, and the little boy decided to control on his anger. The boy gradually began to notice the anger generating moments deliberately. He tried to control his temper over the next few weeks, and the number of nails he was hammering into the fence slowly decreased. Finally, the day came when the boy didn't lose his temper at all. He told his father the news, and the father suggested that the boy should now pull out a nail every day he kept his temper under control. The days passed, and the young boy was finally able to tell his father that all the nails were gone. The boy learnt the art of getting rid of anger. He was very happy as he could change his behavior. The father took his son by the hand and led him to the wooden fence of backyard. The father said, Excellent. You have done very well, my son, but look at the holes in the fence. The fence will never be the same. When you say things in anger, they leave a scar just like this one. You can put a knife in a man and draw it out. It won't matter how many times you say I'm sorry, the wound is still there. Moral of the inspirational story. Control your anger before it controls you. Many times due to heat of the moments we say things to others on which which we feel regret later on. The words are like bullets which can never come back to weapon once triggered. Same way like bullets, words leave deep scars on the mind and souls of others. Those wounds are like holes in the fence which are irreparable. You may apologize, taking the nails out of fence, but scar, holes in fence, will always remain there. Try to be mindful and be present in the moment. When you practice mindfulness, you become more aware of your thought patterns and behavior. You will start noticing the triggers which makes you angry. It will help you to change your response towards those stimulants. Another message from this inspirational story apart from controlling your anger is having good communication skills. When you work on that, you become conscious about your words selection. It helps you to speak calibrated sentences with controlled emotions. So good emotional health combined with good communication skills will help you to improve your existing relationships and build new relations, which in turn improve your overall personality. 34. Five more minutes. It was cozy morning in the winters and sun rays were giving soothing effect on the body. Robert took out some time from his busy schedule and went to the park near his house. His five-years-old daughter, Claudia, was insisting him that she wants to play in the playground of the garden. 
They reached at park and Claudia started playing on the toy bike in the garden. Robert sat on a bench near the playground and started observing his daughter. After half an hour, a young woman came and sat down next to Robert. Robert was feeling quite happy while he was looking towards her daughter. The lady sitting next to him smiled and said, That's my son over there. She pointed to a little chubby boy in a blue sweater who was gliding down the slide. He's a cute-looking boy, Robert said. That's my daughter on the bike in the pink dress. Then, looking at his watch, Robert called to his daughter. What do you say, Claudia? Shall we go now? Claudia pleaded, No, just five more minutes, Dad. Please? Just five more minutes. Robert nodded, and Claudia continued to ride her bike to her heart's content. Fifteen minutes passed, and Robert stood and called again to his daughter. Come on, Claudia, it's time to go now. Claudia again pleaded, Five more minutes, Dad. Give me just five more minutes. Robert smiled and said, Okay, sweetheart. Claudia continued playing. She was really enjoying, and Robert was smiling and watching her. His eyes were filled with full of happiness. After fifteen minutes or so, same thing got repeated. Robert called Claudia, and she pleaded to allow her to play for a few more minutes. Robert happily permitted her to play for some more time. The woman sitting next to Robert was observing all this and was quite surprised with the behavior of Robert. She said, You certainly are a patient father. I appreciate your efforts to entertaining your daughter's request again and again with smiling face. If I would have been at your place, I would have certainly got annoyed. Robert smiled and then replied, Her older brother John was killed by a drunk driver last year while he was riding his bike and coming back home. I never spent much time with John, and now I would give anything for spending just five more minutes with him. I vowed not to make the same mistake with Claudia. She thinks she has five more minutes to ride her bike. The truth is, I get five more minutes to watch her play. In today's competitive environment, everyone gives more priority to career and work. People have hectic routines to achieve their goals in professional life. You should always ensure to maintain a good work-life balance. Spend some time with your family members and friends. In the story, Robert learned the hard way to prioritize his family on top of all others. No matter how busy things get, don't forget to spend time with people that matters to you. Another great message conveyed through this story is to learn from your past mistakes, accept them, and ensure not to repeat them in future. Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. The story also conveys the importance of living in the present moment. Robert imbibed this in his life and understood the importance of present moment. He was not only noticing the happiness of Claudia after getting five more minutes, he also had self-awareness that actually he is giving five more minutes to himself to watch her daughter playing. I have found that most of the people say they are earning and doing hard work for their children. I agree that money is important aspect for their education and other needs, but ensure to spare some time out of your busy schedule to spend along with them, be it playing along with them, going to movies, play zones in malls, or cycling along with them, it all will help you enhancing bonding and also burst your stress. 35. Laziness won't benefit you. This short story comes from ancient times. It is believed that a king ordered his men to place a boulder on the roadway. He then hid in the bushes to see if anybody would move the boulder out of the way. The story states that the king's wealthiest merchants and courtiers walked past the boulder without batting an eyelid. They assumed moving the boulder was a job beneath them. Somebody else would do it. The boulder remained on the road for many days. Many people started to get quite angry at the king, blaming him for the state of the roads. However, not one person took the time to move the boulder. Until one day, a peasant came along carrying vegetables. He approached the boulder and, without hesitation, decided that he would try to move it. He attempted to push the stone away, which took a lot of effort and time. With much pushing and straining, he finally managed, 
and the boulder was finally moved. The peasant returned to where the boulder sat to collect his vegetables. To his surprise, a purse was lying on the road, containing an array of gold coins and a note from the king. It explained that whoever moved the boulder would receive the gold. The takeaway of the story, our life is an opportunity. You shouldn't expect other people to do everything for you in life. Though it may be difficult, you should push yourself and better yourself. Not only this, but sometimes you have to make decisions that benefit the greater good. Of course, you may not always be treated with a purse of gold. However, you will be in direct control of your future. The story's moral is that hard work and independence will always benefit you in life. 36. The Window Seat Once upon a time in Durban, two men, both seriously ill, admitted to same hospital. They occupied the same hospital room. One patient had window in the side wall, or you can say had the window seat or bed, while the other one had simple wall without any windows in it. The patient having his bed next to the room's only window was allowed to sit up in his fowler bed for an hour every day in the afternoon to help drain the fluid from his lungs. The other patient had to spend all his time flat on his back. Both the patients became friends soon and used to talk for hours every day. They used to speak about their families, friends, and occupation. They also talked about their involvement in the military service and about their holiday. Every afternoon, when the patient in the bed by the window could sit up, he would pass the time by describing to his roommate all the beautiful things he could see outside the window. The patient in the other bed began to live for those one-hour periods where his world would be broadened and enlivened by all the activity and color of the world outside. The patient with the window seat used to sit by window and describe to his roommate how the window overlooked a park with a lovely lake. Ducks and swans played on the water while children sailed their model boats. Young lovers walked arm in arm amidst flowers of every color, and a fine view of the city skyline was visible in the distance. As the patient by the window seat described all this in exquisite details, the patient on the other side of the room would close his eyes and imagine this picturesque scene. The other patient grieved the death of his roommate. As the days passed by, he started missing the way his roommate described the view out of the window. In a hope to have a glimpse out of the window and the beautiful world outside, the other patient asked, shift him on bed next to the window. The nurse was happy to make the switch, and after making sure he was comfortable, she left him alone. Though he improved on his health conditions, yet he was not comfortable enough to sit on his own. Slowly, painfully, he propped himself up on one elbow to take his first look at the real world outside. He strained to slowly turn to look out the window besides the bed. It was surprising to him. The window faced a simple wall. The patient asked the nurse what could have compelled his deceased roommate to describe such beautiful and wonderful things outside this window. The nurse responded that the patient was blind and could not even see the wall. She said, Perhaps he just wanted to make you happy. The story is simply heart-touching and communicate many important messages. First one, there is nothing more satisfying than to see someone smile. And above all, to know that you are the reason behind that smile makes you more satisfied. Spread happiness and bring sunshine in the life of others. When you make others happy, everyone see you as a positive and happy person. It helps you build strong, loving relationships. The easiest path to happiness lies in making others happy. Second, have courage and accept the situations. The bling patients accepted the adversity, blindness. He was happy person spreading happiness and smile in surrounding environment. Third, be mindful and live in the present moment. Though the patient on the bed away from window could not see outside, Yet he was mindful and enjoying the beauty outside as described by the patient near the window seat. To conclude, share and spread happiness around you. It is the best way to keep yourself and others happy. 37. Puppies for Sale 
In a small town of Northern California called Oxnard, a pet shop owner painted a sign advertising the pups and nailed it above his door that said, Puppies for Sale. The shopkeeper knew that signs like this always attract the young children. To no surprise, a little boy saw the sign and approached the shop owner. The little boy asked, I want to buy one of your puppies. For how much are you going to sell the puppies? The little boy dropped his head for a moment. He thought for a while and pulled out some change from his pocket. He asked, I have $3.87. Is that enough to take a look? Can I please look at the puppies? The pet shop owner got impressed with the innocence of the boy. Sure, said the shop owner. He smiled and whistled loudly. Here, Scissor, he called. Out of the kennel came his dog named Scissor, who ran down the walkway of the pet shop, followed by five teeny, tiny balls of fur. The little boy pressed his face against the chain-link fence with full of joy. His eyes danced with delight. As the puppies made their way towards the fence, the little boy noticed that one puppy was lagging considerably behind. This puppy was hobbling and trying its best to catch up the others. Immediately, the little boy pointed out towards the lagging, shambling puppy and asked, What's wrong with that little puppy? The shop owner explained that when the puppy was born, the veterinarian had examined the little puppy and had discovered it didn't have a hip socket. It would limp for the rest of his life. The little boy got really excited and said, That is the puppy that I want to buy. The shop owner replied, No, that puppy is not for sale. Nobody will buy that puppy due to his physical deficiencies. If you really want him, I'll just give him to you for free. The little boy got quite upset with the reply of shop owner. He looked straight into the store owner's eyes, pointing his finger and said, I don't want you to give him to me. That little dog is worth every bit as much as all the other dogs and I'll pay full price. In fact, I'll give you $3.87 now and 85 cents a month until I have him paid for. The shop owner countered, You really don't want to buy this little dog. He is never going to be able to run and jump and play with you like the other puppies. Are you sure you want this dog? To his surprise, the little boy reached down and rolled up his pant leg to reveal a badly twisted, crippled left leg supported by a big metal brace. He looked up at the shop owner and softly replied, Well, I don't run so well myself, and the little puppy will need someone who understands. The world is full of creatures who need someone who understands. Everyone one of us has his own weakness, be it a physical or a psychological one. If you are willing to, you can make advantages of your shortcomings and weaknesses instead of allowing them to become obstacles in reaching your goals. The trick is to not let them stop you in your journey of self-improvement. Find and surround yourself with people who support you and challenge you to be a better yourself. According to Bible verse Isaiah 40, 29, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. So God is always with you. God has given many strengths. Focus on your strengths and move ahead in life. Another message this story communicate is to have empathy. When you put yourself in another person's shoes, then you have better understanding. In the story, boy was able to understand the pain of little puppy because he himself has faced that pain. 38. Power of Silence once upon a time in ancient Japan, there was a young disciple named Kiyoshi who was eager to learn the ways of Zen. He was a diligent student, practicing his meditation and studying the sutras. But he still felt that he lacked a deeper understanding of the true essence of Zen. Hearing about a wise Zen master named Hoshin who lived on a remote mountain, Kiyoshi decided to embark on a journey to seek the master's guidance and wisdom. After a long and arduous journey through the dense forests and steep mountain paths, Kiyoshi finally arrived at Hoshin's humble abode. The master was known to be a man of few words, but possessed immense wisdom that was highly sought after by those 
on a path of spiritual enlightenment. Kiyoshi respectfully bowed before the Zen master and expressed his desire to learn the meaning of Zen. The wise old master looked deeply into the young disciple's eyes and remained silent for a while, as if weighing the sincerity of his request. As Kiyoshi grew more anxious, the master finally picked up a stone and struck it against the ground. The stone produced a sharp, clear sound that echoed through the surrounding mountains. Hoshin then asked Kiyoshi, Do you hear the sound of the stone? The young disciple, puzzled but intrigued, replied that he did indeed hear the sound. The Zen master then asked Kiyoshi, Now listen to the sound of silence. Kiyoshi, determined to understand the lesson, focused his attention on the silence that followed the sound. At first it seemed like an impossible task. His mind was filled with thoughts and distractions, but he persisted, trying to become more aware of the silence between the sounds. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months. Kiyoshi continued to meditate on the sound of silence under the guidance of Master Hoshin. The young disciple started to notice subtle changes within himself. His mind began to quieten and his awareness of the world around him heightened. Kiyoshi discovered that silence was not merely the absence of sound, but rather a profound presence that had the power to reveal hidden truths. One day, while meditating by the river, Kiyoshi became aware of the gentle sound of the water flowing over the rocks. He listened intently to the symphony of nature. In the spaces between the notes, he heard the sound of silence. It was as if the entire universe was whispering its wisdom to him, and he felt a deep sense of peace and tranquility. Kiyoshi continued to train with Master Hoshin, learning to embrace the power of silence in every aspect of his life. He found that when he truly listened, the silence would guide him, offering insights and clarity that he could not find elsewhere. As the years passed, Kiyoshi's reputation as a wise and compassionate teacher began to spread throughout the land. People from all walks of life came to seek his counsel and guidance. He would often share the story of his own journey to enlightenment and the power of silence that had transformed his life. One day, a wealthy merchant named Kenji arrived at Kiyoshi's doorstep, seeking help in resolving a dispute between his two sons. The brothers had grown distant and resentful towards each other due to a disagreement over the family business. Kiyoshi invited the merchant and his sons to join him in meditation by the river. As they sat in silence, the sound of the flowing water, the gentle rustling of leaves in the wind, ruled the air. The brothers, initially resistant to the idea of meditation, gradually began to relax and open themselves to the experience. After some time, Kiyoshi asked them to share their thoughts and feelings. To their surprise, both brothers found that the silence had given them a new perspective on the disagreement. As they listened to each other's words, they realized that their conflict was rooted in misunderstandings and unspoken expectations. The silence had allowed them to see beyond their emotions and hear the truth in each other's hearts. Kenji, witnessing the transformation in his sons, was deeply moved and grateful to Kiyoshi. He asked the wise teacher how he could repay him for his guidance. Kiyoshi simply smiled and said, Continue to practice the power of silence and share this gift with others. The merchant and his sons returned to their village, forever changed by their encounter with Kiyoshi and the power of silence. They learned to cultivate a deeper understanding of themselves and others. Their relationships flourished as a result. As for Kiyoshi, he continued to teach and guide countless seekers on their path to spiritual enlightenment. He never tired of sharing the transformative power of silence and the profound wisdom it could reveal. Years later, as Kiyoshi lay on his deathbed, his disciples gathered around him, seeking one final lesson from the beloved master. With a weak yet peaceful smile, Kiyoshi whispered, 
Listen to the sound of silence, and you will hear the wisdom of the universe. And with that, the great teacher closed his eyes and breathed his last, leaving behind a legacy of wisdom and compassion that would inspire generations to come. The story of Kiyoshi and the power of silence serves as a reminder that true wisdom and understanding can often be found in the spaces between the noise and distractions of our daily lives. By embracing the power of silence, we open ourselves to the possibility of growth, transformation, and a deeper connection to the world around us. 39. The Story of Life Sometimes people come into your life and you know right away that they were meant to be there, to serve some sort of purpose, teach you a lesson, or to help you figure out who you are or who you want to become. You never know who these people may be, possibly your roommate, neighbor, co-worker, long-lost friend, lover, or even a complete stranger. But when you lock eyes with them, you know at that very moment that they will affect your life in some profound way. And sometimes, things happen to you that may seem horrible, painful, and unfair at first. But in reflection, you find that without overcoming those obstacles, you would have never realized your potential, strength, willpower, or heart. Everything happens for a reason. Nothing happens by chance or by means of luck. Illness, injury, love, Lost moments of true greatness and sheer stupidity all occur to test the limits of your soul. Without these small tests, whatever they may be, life would be like a smoothly paved, straight, flat road to nowhere. It would be safe and comfortable, but dull and utterly pointless. The people you meet who affect your life and the success and downfalls you experience help to create who you become. Even the bad experiences can be learned from. In fact, they are probably the most poignant and important ones. If someone hurts you, betrays you, or breaks your heart, forgive them, for they have helped you learn about trust and the importance of being cautious when you open your heart. If someone loves you, love them back unconditionally, not only because they love you, but because, in a way, they are teaching you to love and how to open your heart and eyes to things. Make every day count. Appreciate every moment and take from those moments everything that you possibly can for you may never be able to experience it again. Talk to people that you have never talked to before and actually listen. Let yourself fall in love, break free, and set your sights high. Hold your head up because you have every right to. Tell yourself you are a great individual and believe in yourself, for if you don't believe in yourself, it will be hard for others to believe in you. You can make of your life anything you wish. Create your own life, then go out and live it with absolutely no regrets. 40. Building your house. An elderly carpenter was ready to retire. He told his employer contractor of his plans to leave the house-building business to live a more leisurely life with his wife and enjoy his extended family. He would miss the paycheck each week, but he wanted to retire. They could get by. The contractor was sorry to see his good worker go and asked if he could build just one more house as a personal favor. The carpenter said yes, but over time it was easy to see that his heart was not in his work. He resorted to shoddy workmanship and used inferior materials. It was an unfortunate way to end a dedicated career. When the carpenter finished his work, his employer came to inspect the house. Then he handed the front door key to the carpenter and said, This is your house, my gift to you. The carpenter was shocked. What a shame. If he had only known he was building his own house, he would have done it all so differently. So, it is with us. We build our lives, a day at a time, often putting less than our best into the building. Then, with a shock, we realize we have to live in the house we have built. If we could do it over, we would do it much differently. But you cannot go back. You are the carpenter, and every day you hammer a nail, place a board, or erect a wall. Someone once said, Life is a do-it-yourself project. 
Your attitude and the choices you make today help build the house you will live in tomorrow. Therefore, build wisely. 41. The Secret to Success Once a young man asked the wise man Socrates the secret to success. Socrates patiently listened to the man's question and told him to meet him near the river the following day for the answer. So the next day, Socrates asked the young man to walk with him towards the river. As they went in the river, the water got up to their neck. But to the young man's surprise, Socrates ducked him into the water. The young man struggled to get out of the water. But Socrates was strong and kept him there until the boy started turning blue. Finally, Socrates pulled the man's head out of the water. The young man gasped and took a deep breath of air. Socrates asked, What did you want the most when your head was in the water? The young man replied, Air. Socrates said, That is the secret to success. When you want success as badly as you wanted the air while you were in the water, then you will get it. There is no other secret. A burning desire is the starting point of all accomplishment. Just like a small fire cannot give much heat, a weak desire cannot produce great results. 42. Everyone has a story. A young man in his twenties was seeing out from the train's window shouted, Father, look at the trees! They are going behind! The young man's father smiled at the man, and a young couple sitting nearby looked at the young man's childish comment with pity. Suddenly, the young man exclaimed again, Father, look at the clouds. They are all running with us. The couple couldn't resist and said to the old man, Why don't you take your son to a good doctor? The older man smiled and said, We did, and we are just coming from the hospital. My son was blind from birth, and he just got his vision today. Every person in the world has a story. Don't judge people before you truly know them. The truth might surprise you. 43. Soar like an eagle. Did you know that an eagle can foresee when a storm is approaching long before it breaks? Instead of hiding, the eagle will fly to some high point and wait for the winds to come. When the storm hits, it sets its wings so that the wind can pick it up and lift it above the storm. While the storm rages below, the eagle soars above it. The eagle does not escape or hide from the storm. Instead, it uses the storm to lift it higher. It rises on the stormy winds which others dread. When the storm of life or challenges hits us, we can rise above them and soar like the eagle that rides the storm's winds. Don't be afraid of the storms or the challenges in your life. Use it to lift you higher in your life. 44. The Old Carpenter A carpenter with years of experience was ready to retire. He communicated with his contractor about his plans to leave the house-building business to live a more leisurely, retired life with his wife and family. The contractor felt a little upset that his excellent and experienced carpenter was leaving the job, but he requested the carpenter to build just one more house for him. The carpenter agreed with the contractor, but his heart was not in his work like it used to be. He resorted to shoddy craftsmanship and used inferior materials for building the last house of his career. It was an unfortunate way to end his career. When the carpenter completed the house and the employer came to inspect the home, he looked around the house and just before he exited the house, he handed the front door key to the carpenter. This is your house, he said, my gift to you. This was a massive surprise to the carpenter. Although it was supposed to be a good surprise, he wasn't feeling good as he felt a deep shame inside him. If he had only known he was building his own house, he would have done it all so differently. Now he had to live in a home that wasn't built that well. Like the carpenter, we build our lives in a distracted way, reacting rather than acting, willing to put up with less rather than the best. Give your best. Your attitudes and the choices you make today will be your life tomorrow. Build it wisely. 45. Two Neighbors A wise and successful man bought a beautiful house with a vast orchard. 
but not all were happy for him. An envious man lived in an old house next to him. He constantly tried to make his fellow neighbors stay in the beautiful house as miserable as possible. He threw garbage under his gate and did other nasty things. One fine day, the wise man woke up in a good mood and went into the porch to notice buckets of garbage thrown there. The man took a bucket and cleaned his porch. He carried a bucket and went to knock on his envious neighbor's door. The envious neighbor heard a knock at his door and gleefully thought, I finally got him. He answered his door, ready to quarrel with his prosperous neighbor. However, the wise man gave him a bucket of freshly picked apples, saying, The one who is rich in something shares it with others. <laughs>